let's take our Bibles, please. Psalm 46. Psalm number 46, please. Let me read a thank you that we have received here at the church as well. It says, Dear church family, on behalf of the Clark family, I want to thank you for your prayers and support during this difficult time with the passing of my brother, Terry Clark. The flower arrangement was beautiful and a comfort to our family. That's from Debbie, whom we're still praying for, and her family. As I've said before, um, if you've gone through that up close and personal, uh, you know once the funeral's over, it's not over. Everyone else goes back to life, but uh, you continue on dealing, processing um, the loss and so I would also ask you to pray for uh, Dolores and, and Nikki um, and what's going on in their life right now as well. Uh, so let's go ahead and, and see what God has for us here this morning in Psalm 46. Father, God, please, we need your help this morning. Um, we have our finite minds trying to understand yours. And yet what you wrote, uh, you wrote for us. So um, we can comprehend this, but help us not to just to learn, but God, let it go past our head to our heart. I pray that your spirit would show us how to do uh, these truths here today. Help it to be real in our lives. God, I pray that we would allow it to be real in our lives and that you would get the honor and glory for your words today. In Jesus' name, amen. So instead of starting with Psalm, I'm going to back up to the book of Job, okay? In the opening of the book of Job, if you're familiar with Job at all, we would, we would find his entire world is turned upside down. He, he suffered a great financial loss, more than great, it was everything. He suffered the loss of the lives of all his children, the loss of his physical life, or physical health, and even the loss of the support of his wife. And you may recall at one point she said, Job, why don't you just curse God and die? Just get, just be done with it all. Wow, thanks for the encouragement, dear. <laughs> now, hearing of his tragedies, his friends came from a great distance to be with him. And, and they sat with him. They sat for seven days as Job grieved in silence. The grief was so deep. Um, by the way, just a side note here. A lot of times during a time of death, people just get really weird. Like, not the one who's going through it, but everyone else. We get weird and maybe you, you get weird because you feel like, oh, I don't know what to say. And the only thing that comes to our minds is like overused cliches, okay? You don't have to say anything. Sometimes just being there with the person as Job's friends were, not saying a word. And they, they, where they were with him for seven days. No one said anything. And then in Job chapter 3 and verse 25, he broke the silence with these words. He said, the thing which I greatly feared has come upon me. Now, what is it that we greatly fear? It's probably different, right, for all of us. Um, maybe it's health-related. We greatly fear the dreaded C word, right? Maybe, um, maybe it's politically related. Oh no, if they win the election, the sky will fall. The world will come to an end if they are reelected or whatever side of the aisles, aisles that you're on. For some, it might be losing our freedoms. Have you ever thought about that? I mean, we've grown up in America. This is the way life is. This is the way it, it's, this is normal. But not so in most of the world. 
Yesterday, last week, last month, last year, last decade, there were, there were people born and some were married and some were buried in countries where you're not allowed to go to church. That's normal for them. Could that happen here? What do you think? Yes, absolutely. Could it happen 10 years from now? That might be believable. How about one year from now? Could that happen? Yep. How about next week? Could that happen? Yes, because it is not determined by who's in Washington or the political culture at the time. It is determined by God, okay? And the Israelites learned that. They were their nation, and then the next day, over and over again throughout the Old Testament, the next day, boom, the Babylonians come in, the Assyrians come in, and they are no more, just like that. And God moved the hearts of kings, and God still does that. Imagine the tornado sirens going off here in Taylorville, adequately named home of the tornadoes <laughs> and you run you run for the safest place in wherever you live okay uh, a basement a bomb shelter a bathtub whatever it is and after the storm passes you you come out of your safe place to see that your safe place is all that's left everything is gone your house is gone. Your furniture is gone. The family heirlooms are gone. Your keepsakes are gone. Everything in the attic that you didn't even know was there because it had been there so long, that's gone. But you don't know it because you didn't even know it was there, right? The photographs are gone. Your dog is gone. It's all gone. Or imagine waking one morning to find soldiers of a foreign enemy power at your doorstep, demanding you come with them. You've been deemed an enemy of the new state and you're whisked away somewhere. Or you get a knock at the door and there's some official looking people standing there at your door and they inform you that several of your loved ones had just been killed in an accident. Could these things happen? Yes. Devastating. I don't know if there's a good word, uh, an, an adequate word. It was, it was one of these scenarios that scholars believe was taking place when, when this psalm, Psalm 46, was written during the time of the Assyrian invasion of Judah. Now, keep in mind, this wasn't just an invasion of a foreign power that they just needed to marshal their militia and fight them back. These were the Assyrians, okay? They were known for their brutality. Soldiers decapitated the defeated enemies and would build pyramids out of their heads. The Assyrians would decorate trees with the heads of their enemies like they were ornaments. Uh, amputation of limbs, uh, burning people, including small children, alive. They were, they were very creative about the brutality. Perhaps their worst fears were being realized. What would you do? Well, you're a good Christian, right? I know what you would do. You would quote Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good, right? And that's just not going to cut it, is it? At some point, at some point in our lives, we're probably going to face circumstances that we feel are are more than what we can handle. We'll, we will know that helpless feeling of being able to do nothing to change our situation. God's given us Psalm 46 for those times. 
It was, it was this psalm that was the inspiration for the hymn we sang earlier, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. So let's look at our first point. Confess God as your refuge and strength when the overwhelming whatever happens. First thing, confess God as your refuge and, and strength. Psalm 46, verse 1, the psalmist starts off, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And God is attempting through the psalmist to his people to get them to lean fully on him with a calmness, the kind of calmness that only faith can bring about. Folks, God is our refuge and our strength and our safety and our power. He is always ready to help in times of trouble, maybe not remove the trouble, but he's there to help us through the trouble. The fact is that when trouble strikes, God's present. Psalm 46, verse 2, it says, Therefore, because of that fact, we will not fear. Though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, not only is he present, but he enables us to conquer fear. So we can go through it without fear, without anxiety, without running around. Oh no, the sky's falling. <laughs> Second Timothy chapter one and verse seven. Please remember this verse. If you're one that's prone to fear, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love and of sound mind. So when we are fearing, okay, oh no, what if, what if this happens? What if that happens? Then we have to remind ourselves or hopefully for the rest of us, one of our godly friends will be willing to speak the truth to us and tell us fear is not from God. Well, if it's not from God, where does it come from? Satan. Hopefully, one of our godly friends would be willing to share that, to remind us of that. The, the psalmist references four natural disasters in verses 2 and 3. Uh, earthquakes, hurricanes, tsunamis, volcanoes. Those are pretty powerful things. Even those cannot shake us when we are by faith taking refuge in God. Folks, when serious problems happen in our lives, our first tendency can be to panic or fear. We might immediately at least become anxious or, or fretting over what may happen, or what are we going to do now? And then realizing there is nothing we can do, our panic, our fear, our anxiety might even increase at that point. Okay? Take a deep breath. Just let it out slowly. Can we remind ourselves of something? We don't face that situation alone. On a smaller scale, what do you see happen in, in our society, in our culture, when someone's having a problem, okay? Oh, I had a flat tire. Or, oh no, um, um, I burned the pot roast or whatever, okay? Well, people don't cook that much anymore, okay? <laughs> My gift card for the restaurant didn't work, okay? And uh, all these major problems that people have. And what do they do? What do we do? Throw them on social media, right? And it just, doesn't it, don't you feel awful when no one responds? <laughs> now you feel really alone, don't you? 
No one cares that my gift card didn't work, okay? But no, all these people respond and we feel better. Now we're surrounded by people, okay? And now think about this on a grander scheme. When, when these catastrophes happen, we are not alone. God's spirit lives within us. Therefore, he is always with us, and when trouble happens, we don't have to, to wait for God to arrive. He's already there. In fact, he was there yesterday when we were still in the day before. <laughs> yes, he's in the future, too. Joshua chapter 1 and verse 9, it says, Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Number two, be assured of God's presence and power. Verse six, there is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. This river, it says in verse five, God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her. And that right early, the heathen raged, the kingdoms were moved. He, is, he uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Wow, what a contrast from verses 2 and 3. Compare them to 4, 5, 6, and 7. We go from external circumstances of earthquakes, hurricanes, volcanoes, tsunamis, to a river. That provides joy. In the, in the midst of chaos, look, okay? Look away from the chaos and notice the quiet stream in the chaos. You might say, where? I don't see it. John 7, 38 he that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Folks, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in believers is the source of that peace. In the, in the midst of the chaos. Okay. So how do we tap into that during the chaos? Philippians 4, 6. Be careful, be anxious, don't worry about anything, but in everything, prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. So we go back to the source of that peace. This is how we tap into it. We go back to the source of that peace. We spend I say this um, on Mondays for my uh, devotional that I have online. And I say it, I think, at the end of every single one. Uh, I just say, spend some time with Jesus. Folks, we need to do that. Spend some time with Jesus. We go back to the source. We focus on him. And then the very next verse, Philippians 4, 7, tells us what happens. The peace of God, which... My rendition blows our minds. We can't understand it. Shall keep our hearts and our minds through Christ Jesus. The, the phrase at the end of verse 5 is, is a reference to his giving hope for a new day in Psalm 46. Or, or poetically speaking, the storm isn't going to last forever. It may feel like it. It may seem like it. But it's not. The, um, who sang this? Little Orphan Annie. The sun will come out tomorrow, right? Have you, did you watch that movie? The sun will come out tomorrow. Because it will. It always does. He won't allow us to suffer forever. This is, this is the anchor of our soul. That, that the hymns speak of. We have an anchor that keeps the soul. You know this hymn. Steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Fastened to the rock which cannot move. 
grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. Uh, not only is he the source of peace for believers, but he's the source of chaos for nations on our behalf. He rules over the kingdoms of this world. Israel's history is this ongoing saga, it seems, of nations rising up against her. Uh, scripture tells us of the troubles that yet await the nation. We can read that through the Old Testament. But Israel's history also records God's faithfulness to her, his faithfulness to fight for her. As, as the Gentile nations raged against Israel, one by one, if we look back through the Old Testament at every single one of those nations that rose up against Israel, where are they today? They are no more. They, they were brought down and carried away. God spoke, as it says in the psalm, and they melted at his powerful word. This is exactly what will happen in the end times, is for what people call it right now, the end times, the end of the world. When the nations of the world are going to unite against God's people and Christ will return, the Bible tells us, and destroy his and Israel's enemies. And they will just melt away. Psalm 46, 7, it promises that God, the Lord of hosts, the commander of heaven's armies, is our God of refuge, our safe place. There's, there's four gifts that God gives us in times of overwhelming trouble. Let me give you those four gifts. The first one is this. God refreshes us in the midst of our trouble. Okay, that comes from verse 4. Because of his unfailing love, he offers us cool, rejuvenating waters of peace and joy. But we have to drink those waters by fellowshipping with him through prayer and meditating on his word. Spend some time with Jesus. It all comes back to that. Jesus said, if any thirst, let him come to me and drink. 2 Corinthians 4, 16, it says, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Paul is speaking of someone there who's spending time with Jesus. Here's a second gift. Whatever may happen in our lives, we can rest because God lives within us. And then a third gift. God has given us the hope of a bright tomorrow. Uh, this won't last forever, whatever it is. Our, our season of suffering will end. That is our future, an end to the suffering. That is our hope for tomorrow. Folks, this is our promise found in Revelation 21, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no more sorrow, no crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And here's the fourth gift. God has given us the record of his past faithfulness to strengthen us for our present challenges, okay? How many of you love reading um, the New Testament over the Old Testament? The New Testament, I, I would say that's, that's my favorite too. It's just so much more practical and, and the Old Testament, um, especially the book of Numbers, okay? And so-and-so begat so-and-so, begat so-and-so, begat so-and-so, and he had 337 more children and lived 472 more years and died. And then go back, take his first of 17 children, and go through the same thing with all of them. <laughs> oh, wow. But the Old Testament is more than that. But the Old Testament 
God has given us a record of all of his past faithfulness to his people. It's right there for us. Remember David throughout the Psalms as we've been going through these, when, when he's having one of his moments, despair, crisis, um, uh, forsaken by friends, discouragement, depression, and he's recounting all of these problems. His life is in danger in some of the Psalms. And then in the middle he says, but then I remembered. And he starts recounting God's past faithfulness. Romans 15, 4, it says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. Why? So that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. Lamentations 3, 21. This I recall to my mind. Therefore have I hope. Uh, Psalm 46, verses 8 through 10. It kind of shifts a little gear here. And we have our third point. It is a picture of the last days. Um. Let's just go ahead and read verse 8. Come, behold the works of the Lord. What desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow, or the bow, cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. Folks, God is our refuge. We've been assured of his presence and power. We have nothing to fear of the last days. I hope you don't, Okay. Because we're not going to be here when all this happens anyway. He gives us a glimpse here of what's to come. He destroys the nations and he brings peace to earth. With its constant wars and, and chaos in this world right now, okay? Chaos, whether it's COVID, financial crisis, frustrating political maneuvering, whatever it is. Our world seems to be reeling out of control. Really, what can you do to stop it? I mean, I hate to sound fatalistic about politics and elections. You have a responsibility to vote. God gave you that right. You need to use it, by the way, okay? But everything seems to be out of control. But remember, God is in control, and his purposes will be accomplished. Whether we think they're good, bad, or ugly, they're all good because they're his purposes. Just as God is in control of all of the world affairs, he's also in control of the details of our lives. Overwhelming trouble can sometimes send us into this downward spiral, creating uncertainty and, and fear for some people. When, when other people are working evil against us, God uses it for good. It wasn't fair what they did. I got fired because of what they did. I got written up. I got whatever it is. It just wasn't fair. They were evil. I didn't do anything wrong. God uses it for good. Yeah, where? Come with me. Let's go back to the Old Testament. And let's look at the life of Joseph, whose brother sold him into slavery. Went home and told his dad, oh, he's dead. A lion got him. So no one was even out looking for him. And yet, years down the road, Joseph, standing before his brothers, now he's second ruler in Egypt, can look at his brothers and say, hold on, God meant it for good. We may not see the good right now, but God means it for good. He, he, he wisely weaves every thread of our lives into a, a garment of holiness, transforming us, into the image of his son, Christ. Proverbs 21 and verse 1, it says, The king's heart, by the way, that's all kings, is in the hand of the Lord, as the rivers of water. He turneth it whithersoever he will. Isaiah 14, it says, This is the purpose that is purposed upon the whole earth, and this is the hand 
of power and judgment that is stretched out upon all the nations, for the Lord of hosts hath purposed, and who shall disannul it? And his hand is stretched out, and who shall turn it back? You ever play that game with kids? You put a quarter in your hand, small kids, okay? Uh, not like one of our teenagers. And say, you can have it if you can get it out. And they're trying their hardest to get your fingers open. And they can't. That's kind of the picture here, okay? God has a plan. Who's going to change it? His hand is pushing out. Who's going to push his hand back, really? God's plans are going to happen whether we like them or not. As Christians, we can rest in his refuge and have faith in his love for us that they're all good. So what do we do in the meantime when, when everything seems to be spinning out of control? It is, and everything's getting worse. Morally, things are falling. Financially, things are getting crazy. Politically, don't even try to understand that. Um, it's just getting more and more awful and awful every single day. What do we do? Number four, be still. Look with me at the next verse, Psalm 46 and verse 10. Be still and know I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Be still. <laughs> Be still. As, as I'm looking across the room here, I can identify several individuals that, that have gone through it in my eight years here. Health chaos. All of a sudden, there it is. Accidents. Death. Hospitals. Emergencies. This. Layoffs, <laughs> all kinds of things represented in this room here. And when you go through that door that's not under your control, it gets pretty, it gets pretty scary. It can be. And when we're scared, what happens? Do you understand what happens when you're scared? Okay. You can ask Pastor Taylor about this because it happens during the week often. Okay. I just startle him once in a while. Sneak up behind him, whatever. Um, your heart starts beating fast, right? Your, your mind is on full alert. Your, your sensory uh, abilities, you're taking in everything. Okay. And God designed us that way. I mean, if you're out walking down the street at night and you hear a big noise, you need to be on guard. Your heart's beating, okay, blood flow is going. Oxygen in the blood is going to every part of your body. In case you need to make a quick retreat, you can start running or shuffling fast, whatever you're able to do, okay? <laughs> and, and the blood flow into your head with all that oxygen, now your mind is alert. You're thinking quick. Your senses are all on high alert. God says, be still. You don't have to run. You don't have to fight. You don't have to figure out what to do. I got this. So he says, just be still. Cease from fear. Cease from worry about the direction that things are going in our world. Uh, know that God is in control of your destiny. Simply put, God is telling people to relax and wait for him to do everything that he's promised to do. When, when the overwhelming trouble strikes, God wants us to be still, to rest in him. Philippians 4, again, verse 6 and 7, Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and your minds 
through Christ Jesus. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Jesus said these words, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Matthew 5, 16, Let your light so shine before men that ye may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now, if we could go back on the screen, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Why? Why should we do that? So that we can do, the next verse, let your light shine before men. As we're going through it, whatever it is, and we're resting in him, our light is shining and people are seeing that. All this is possible for us as Christians if, just as Isaiah 40, 31 says, wait upon the Lord and our strength will be renewed. We'll run, we'll not be weary, we'll walk and not faint if we wait upon the Lord. And that's not sitting back waiting for him to do something. Waiting upon the Lord has the idea of us coming before him, spending time with Jesus. Jesus.